Hi, my name is Jeremy Horst. I'm a practicing pediatric dentist and biochemist. Today we're going to be talking about medical management of cavities. Uh, we're going to go through the clinical trial data to help us decide what, what uh, products we can give to patients that actually work and how well they work and some of the things that we're often talking to patients about that actually don't help with cavities. In per particular, we're going to list all the preventive agents uh, and compare them. And then we're going to go through the details of how to use silver diamine fluoride to treat cavities and prevent cavities, um, how to incorporate that into your practice in terms of a treatment regimen, how frequently to put it on, how to monitor for outcomes, and what to expect. Uh, at the very end, we're going to touch a little bit about how to control the stain from silver fluoride, how to cover it, um, and so on. So thanks, and uh, look forward to you joining us. Uh, great. So all that said, uh, here we go. We have to have objectives, so there's, there's a handful of objectives up here. Uh, what we're trying to learn today is explaining the indications, benefits, and risks for silver diamine fluoride, uh, guiding treatment planning to manage the silver fluoride stain. Um, that's a particularly, um, I think, pretty well solved set of issues that not as, much, uh, not as many folks know about is how to uh, anticipate and handle uh, the stain from silver fluoride. Um, how to monitor outcomes of non-restorative caries management. So monitoring how a filling is doing is different than monitoring how a uh, cavity is responding to silver fluoride. Um, and proposing to patients simple and effective strategies beyond brushing and flossing uh, to prevent caries. And so that's actually what we're going to start with. Here's the outline for the rest of the time that we're going to spend together. We're going to talk about preventives. Uh, there's lots of amazing products that are out there. Um, for prevention, and so I really want to make sure that we kind of go over how well they work and what ones don't work of some of the questions and products that are out there that we have people using. So we're going to have a little bit of an interactive part here uh, that you guys get to take out your pens and write down the three best and let's say the two worst preventives in terms of how well they prevent cavities. I'm going to go through this list and I'll tell you the best one is about 75% less cavities if you do this. And the worst one, there's a few of them on here, uh, it does not do anything at all. So I'm going to march through the list. Fluoride varnish with iodine, with povidone iodine placed beforehand. Uh, xylitol in moms of infants. So the mom is chewing the gum, we're preventing cavities in the child. Uh, xylitol in the infants or toddlers themselves. Uh, daily self-flossing by children. Uh, high strength fluoride toothpaste, 5,000 parts per million fluoride toothpaste, for example. Normal over the counter fluoride toothpaste, 1,100 parts per million. Daily professional flossing, like by a hygienist. Um, vitamin D supplementation. Silver diamine fluoride used as a preventive. MI paste. Uh, Profies, two to four times a year. Arginine added into fluoride toothpaste, uh, or just arginine toothpaste, and then fluoride varnish. So your job is to pick three of those that you think work the best, and two of those that you think do not work at all. All right, so we're going to march through uh, each of these and check out the data. Uh, there's data on, on, on all of these things. And so, why do we floss? Um, if you guys remember, it was like 2016, I think it was, maybe 14, um, there was a big public release of the fact that there's no data supporting flossing for preventing cavities. Um, and it, you know, angered all of the dentists and uh, excited every human who doesn't really want to floss. Um, and it turns out there is data, there are data, <coughs> that show that it doesn't work, <laughs> unfortunately. And so that's um, professional flossing every three months or daily self-flossing among school-aged children. These are mainly like fourth and fifth graders. Um, this is a, a synthesis of clinical trials. This is called a forest plot. We're going to work with this. And basically what you want to look at is the line of equivalence, the line of no effect. If the dot that summarizes the clinical study is on the line, or if the error bar showing the variance in the results overlaps that line, it means there's no effect, that that study measured that there was no effect. And then the diamond that summarizes the studies above it, if that touches the line, it means there's no effect. 
And so what you can see is that kids flossing themselves, um, these are again like 10 or 11 year olds, uh, has no effect on their cavities, unfortunately. And flossing them four times a year has no effect on their cavities, unfortunately. But having a hygienist floss your teeth every day, every school day of the year for two years, actually does make a difference. Um, and so what do I do with this as a clinician? What I do is I, I say, you know, if there is a family that is super motivated and they're doing everything they can think of and the parent or the, the patient themselves, they're older than 10, uh, wants to become a super flosser and we can really spend just a couple minutes working on their technique, they're motivated, can we turn them into a hygienist flossing their teeth? That, that can do something. And for all the other mere humans, it's probably not going to be very useful. Cool. Fluoride toothpaste works. It's a simple strategy. It's a really useful uh, set of skills. <clears throat> what this plot is, is that each of these um, dots are also a summary of lots of clinical trials. And this is, these are different concentrations of fluoride toothpaste that have been studied uh, over the decades. Um, and in other countries, there's, there's different products that have these different concentrations. And so in this country, our over-the-counter product is right around um, 22% less cavities. What does that mean? That means if somebody weren't to be using fluoride toothpaste, they just use a toothpaste that didn't have fluoride, they might get five new cavities. If there was just fluoride in their toothpaste, they would only get four new cavities. So it's that 20, roughly 20% less cavities just by adding fluoride in the toothpaste. Now, what about adding a lot of fluoride into the toothpaste, like some products that we know about with 5,000 parts per million, is that bumps it up to almost twice as much. So uh, instead of five cavities, you would get about three new cavities. So there's a much more potent effect. And what I think you'll see in these slides is that that 37% seems to be kind of a, a topping out number of fluoride products. It seems to be, if you read across the different products and studies of those products, that you get, uh, if you're only adding fluoride, that 37% that seems to be as far as you can go. And so part of the idea here is we need to add other things besides fluoride. Um, this is a complicated slide. I'm sorry about this, but this is, as far as I know, still the only summary of arginine. Anybody know about arginine? Where, where's arginine? Uh, where do we interact with arginine in our lives? Um, anybody ever build muscle? That whey protein, the, the big muscle milk, uh, is, is mainly arginine. Uh, so it, it's in protein. And so proteins are made up of 20 different amino acids. One of them is arginine. So every cell in our bodies has proteins, and every cell in our bodies has a ton of arginine. And it turns out it's in a lot of muscle. You need, to use, you need arginine to build muscle. Um, and it turns out that the chemistry of arginine ends up making bacteria raise the pH instead of lower the pH. It's more basic instead of acidic. And so most bacteria that are in the mouth, if you just feed them arginine, they will not make any acid whatsoever. And lots of the bacteria will actually raise the pH up, protecting the teeth from cavities. Um, and so this has been done in studies with 6,000 patients, 6,000, 3,700 patients, uh, kind of school age kids, uh, kindergarten age kids. And we see right around 17% less cavities if you take a fluoride toothpaste and put some arginine into it. So fluoride toothpaste normally versus uh, fluoride toothpaste with arginine. This has been replicated in studies in older adults, um, 300 uh, older adults in each of these studies. And we have kind of around that same number. So we get a bonus by putting this protein amino acid that's in all the food we eat at different concentrations. Uh, but so raising the concentration of arginine in our mouths twice a day uh, seems to increase the pH. It promotes the healthy bacteria. The strep mutans and the other bacteria that like to convert sugar to acid, they don't use it very much. It slows their growth and they get outcompeted. And so the idea is that in a product that has uh, 1,100 parts per million fluoride, like an over-the-counter fluoride toothpaste, if you add that extra preventive effect, you get up to about 37%. There are products in the United States that, um, that do have uh, arginine, but I don't think any that have arginine and fluoride together. Um, with our, our sisters in Canada, they have some products that have both. Um, 
but I think these are probably going to be coming back. Fluoride varnish. Again, we have this big forest plot with all these different studies, and there was a study not that long ago that got all this press. It was like 60% prevention of cavities. Unfortunately, no other study has ever found that. And if you average them all out, you get this 37% prevent, prevented fraction. So it's that same, I was going to get five cavities, now I only get three. Maybe the cavities are smaller too. So it does have an effect. Uh, you're getting less cavities, you're strengthening the tooth, and there seems to be this, this same kind of saturation point. Once you get enough fluoride going on, you need more. Uh, so it works. Folks are putting it on four times per year for higher risk patients, two times per year uh, for medium risk, uh, moderate risk patients. Um, but what else can we do? So uh, for many decades, folks have been calling for antimicrobials. We know that we need to reduce sugars. We know that we need to uh, improve hygiene, hypothetically. Uh, fluoride works so well to strengthen the teeth. But what about controlling the bacteria? So we talked about arginine a little bit earlier. That seems to guide what the bacteria are doing. How about let's just kill them? Um, so there were a bunch of studies back when uh, penicillin was being introduced of putting penicillin into toothpaste. No effect. Um, still scratching our heads about that one. But we've been looking for a safe, uh, easy to use, inexpensive um, medicine that doesn't taste very bad uh, to put on the teeth to help keep the bacteria down. Um, and it turns out that for about uh, almost 20 years now, the first study was 2002 that was published, people have been doing these clinical trials of putting povidone iodine, the same type of iodine that you would use to clean a wound, that kind of turns your skin brownish orange a little bit, um, to put it on teeth, usually before fluoride varnish. Um, and, and some of the folks were using this uh, after they've taken the kids to the operating room. So the kids have a bunch of cavities, stick them to the operating room, put fillings in their teeth and crowns and all that. And then at the end, let's say, well, right, well, that did nothing to the bacteria, so let's do that. And it turns out that all the studies that, if, uh, that do that once in the operating room and never again, no effect. But if they do it again in three months and again in three months and again in three months, they have a big effect. And so that seems to be the model for antimicrobials, for stuff to control the bacteria in the mouth, is that we need to reapply every two months, every three months, um, to get this effect. And so I think the magic of iodine, of betadine in particular, povidone iodine, um, is that it does stick around. It does move into the crevices and the, the weakened part of the teeth, the porosities. And it stays there for a while. How long does it stay there? That hasn't been studied yet. But clinically, we see great results of about, you know, on average, maybe 40 to 60 percent, somewhere, let's say 40 percent, less cavities if we put this on every two to three months. Um, and so this is really provocative because it's super inexpensive and easy to do. And so literally what this is, is taking like a Dappen dish and putting like six drops of betadine in there, uh, taking a, a cotton applicator and just wiping it on the teeth. Maybe you dry with a two by two first, maybe you don't. You just wipe it on the teeth, just on the facial surfaces and maybe the linguals of the molars, of the upper molars, and then you put the fluoride varnish on over, over that. Uh, and so again, you know, many less cavities. And so the idea here is that when you combine with the effect of fluoride varnish, adding this gets you to about 62% less cavities. We haven't seen really anything like this before. Um, how about prophies? The data are pretty scrambly. Um, but really, I mean, the question, why do we do prophies? What are, what, are, what are dental cleanings for? I think we have at least one hygienist in the room. Why, what, what, do, what are cleanings for? Disrupt biofilm, clean up what you left behind. What disease does do cleanings help to treat and prevent? Gingivitis. Gingivitis. And maybe perio, right? Maybe. Prophies don't, <laughs> but cleanings. Right. Prophies don't do anything for caries. There's lots of studies. I don't have the data summarized here. But right, this is, this is for gums. Um, for young kids who I treat, who I manage, I help to manage in collaboration with their families, um, if they have serious gingivitis or periodontal issues, they have a terrible systemic disease, God forbid. If they have mild gingivitis, their periodontium is going to regenerate when their grown-up teeth come in. 
Like, who, who cares? We should do like brushing instructions so we actually get some movement towards better hygiene at home and maybe that will help. But cleaning the teeth two to four times a year does nothing for cavities, period. Zero. Done. Has anyone heard of casein phosphopeptide amorphous calcium <laughs> phosphate CPPACP? Yeah. Tastes great. Uh, people use it. Um, has anyone heard of anything other than this that the American Dental Association has recommended against? I don't know of anything the ADA has recommended against. And they, the, the American Dental Association says the panel emphasizes that this should not be used as a substitute for fluoride products. They recommend against the use of this material. I have never seen anything so strong. Now, what is this material? It's calcium phosphate and some magic peptides that in the laboratory promote remineralization. And in the laboratory, it really does promote remineralization. Where else can we find calcium and phosphate and magic peptides? Yeah, in the saliva. So for me, if a patient has no saliva or dysfunctional saliva or less saliva than they should, xerostomia, this is still an option. This might be a great resource for them to provide more calcium, more phosphate, and more salivary peptides. Do you know in my last year of full-time pediatric dentistry how many patients I saw with xerostomia? One. I gave her this product. Absolutely. I don't care if the ADA says it's not going to work. All my other patients have great saliva, and this is going to be a huge waste of everybody's time. There's lots of studies on treatment and prevention showing that there's no effect. There's no study in xerostomics. But I know from the science of, of dental caries that we need calcium, we need phosphate, and we need stuff to help put the calcium and phosphate back together in the tooth. So to me, this is a great resource for patients that don't have saliva, that don't have functional saliva. And for everyone else, the ADA recommends against it. So let's replace that with something that works. That's called MI paste. What about the real MI? So we learned yesterday a little bit about motivational interviewing. And there was a study that came out uh, just last night, really, uh, that if you just have a conversation with your patients and uh, help to, <laughs> so <the> same quote, <laughs> not ironically, the key is helping parents to choose one or two behaviors they feel they can change for their child rather than us telling parents what to do that makes the difference. So collaborating to find one or two things that we can change uh, prevents 29% of cavities. So we have this super fancy product that does nothing, and then you know, it's been taking the name away from, a, from the real MI uh, that really does work. So there's a few different studies on uh, motivational interviewing or having a conversation to, tr to have informative troubleshooting um, to try a couple things, and they're all showing uh, reduction in cavities. The middle study, if you just looked at any new cavities, did not have an effect. But if you looked at cavities that would uh, indicate operative treatment, so that they've reached the middle of the dentin, uh, there, was a, there was a very strong effect. Um, and so this, obviously, we should be spending more time learning how to have conversations about care. Um, chlorhexidine. So there's a lot of, um, there's, there's a few folks who are still talking about chlorhexidine for, for cavities. Um, tastes bad, can stain the teeth, um, and it does really weird things to the bacteria on your tongue that help to regulate the, the nitrite and nitrate um, balance in your body. Uh, so there are these side effects, and if it worked, that'd be amazing. Um, there have been clinical trials of varnishes, of rinses, of all that, and none of them show any effect. All of them show no effect at preventing cavities, unfortunately. It kills bacteria, but they come back. So maybe it doesn't stick around long enough, um, you know, it's hard to understand exactly what happens, but there's been a lot of attention placed on this because it kills strep mutans really well. It really does. Uh, but it doesn't prevent cavities. So there's been lots of studies. There was this big uh, randomized clinical trial, and I show this table just to show that the, the people who ran the, clinic, the big multicenter clinical trial in the United States of chlorhexidine for cavities, um, they were so convinced that it, that it should work that they did all of this sub-analysis. There's, there's, there's uh, nine different lines here, and each of them was like a subgroup analysis where they were trying to prove that maybe if we look at it this way, we can have it. It just doesn't. It just doesn't. So that's where this antimicrobial didn't work. 
We have other antimicrobials that work. We have iodine. What else do we have, maybe? Oh, we'll get to that later. Xylitol. Uh, so has anybody ever heard of xylitol? I think the most overlooked resource um, is using xylitol to intervene with the way that we pass down bacteria. Um, and the fact that we do pass down caries as a disease, the idea that this is a transmissible disease to some extent, I think is, is proven by the xylitol studies where they give new mothers who have lots of cavities, lots of strep mutans, active caries, high caries risk, they give those mothers postpartum xylitol gum to chew two to three times a day, eight grams a day, and they watch the kids. They don't do any intervention differently in the kids. They intervene with the mom, either fluoride varnish or chlorhexidine. Numbers go up for chlorhexidine, that's weird. The control here is fluoride varnish two to four times a year. But they give the mom xylitol just for a year from three months to 15 months postpartum uh, to chew a lot. And you can see these numbers, and you don't need statistics to show that when the kids are five years old, they have less than one cavity on average versus the other kids that have three cavities on average. And if you look at the numbers and the studies that have been replicated uh, in other countries, so these, are, these studies are done in three different countries, we have 71% prevention, 78% prevention, 71% prevention. Nothing different in the kids. So we're intervening with the way that bacteria are passed down from the mother to the child. Uh, now, the mother of my children happens to never have had a cavity. My father, who helps take care of my children, has had lots of cavities. We've been working on that. But when he takes care of my kids, I have some xylitol gum put out. And he loves it. He chews it all the time. I have it put out on a shelf that's about this high because I also have a dog who likes to try to eat the xylitol gum if, you know, if it's given to him. But um, it is toxic for dogs, and so don't give it to your dogs. Um, anyway, so we also, I also looked at what this expense would be. And um, I can't talk about brands. On a very popular uh, site that's used to order things that are delivered at your house, uh, if you look and find the um, two grams uh, per tablet and buy a packet of it, Doing this for an entire year would cost 100 bucks. So you think about 100 bucks, 75% less cavities in an effect that goes on for years. It seems pretty cost effective and worthwhile. Um, so share that healthy plaque. <laughs> so in particular, there's been all this messaging, you know, don't kiss your child on the face, don't use share spoons, don't, don't, don't. But if a parent or caretaker has been cultivating healthy plaque in their own mouth and hasn't had cavities for years, they're low caries risk, they should be kissing all the babies. Anyway, that's one of my favorite ones. Um, also, our good friend Peter Milgram, who's done like all of the useful studies on caries, um, he, he created a xylitol syrup. I don't believe there's a, a xylitol syrup product available anywhere. Hopefully, we could maybe change that. I don't know. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so he had parents putting uh, syrup on their own kids' teeth, placebo-controlled study, uh, tasted great. And um, bottom line is there were much less cavities in the kids that got the xylitol syrup uh, versus the other non-sugar sweetener syrup. Um, and they didn't have a no treatment control group, so there was kind of more xylitol versus less xylitol, and there was a pretty potent effect of less cavities. There's also a study with a, with a wipe that has xylitol on it that showed about the same number of less cavities. Um, this is a mess. This, <laughs> this is a mess. I don't, I don't even know how many lines there are here, 17 or something like that. <clears throat> so I gotta tell you guys the story about this. Um, the American Dental Association, for, for over 100 years, had this amazing library of, of all of the literature that was kind of ever written about dentistry in, in English and some in German and some in French and so on. Um, and a few years back, uh, 2005, I think, uh, they decided to close that library because people weren't using it very much and the internet had come and all of that. So a few people, um, like Steve Duffin and my friend Philippe Pujol, um, took a few months and went and went to that library before it finally closed. And what my uh, friend and mentor, Philippe, 
uh, did was he looked through the old literature where they were doing lots of studies, where we, were, we had gotten organized enough to do studies, um, but it hadn't made it to the digital age. And he tried to find something that we've missed, something that was, that was learned and forgotten. And he found that during the pre, uh, the, the, uh, between the two World War era, so 20s, 30s, and early 40s, there were all these controlled trials, not randomized, so, but controlled trials of vitamins for all sorts of different medical ailments. And cavities, this is pre-fluoride, uh, this is booming sugar, cavities was a huge problem for everybody, especially wealthy people. And so it turns out that there were all sorts of studies of vitamins for cavities. And there were lots of studies of vitamin D for cavities. Uh, we knew that it was connected to the bone health and uh, calcium and phosphate in our blood and all that kind of stuff. And so every one of these studies is vitamin D3 versus placebo. And on average, there's 50% less cavities in people who didn't get enough vitamin D and then were supplemented. And vitamin D2 is 60% less cavities for vitamin D supplementation. And in this last group here, uh, it was known that UV exposure to the skin would promote vitamin D production in your own body. And so they put people in what's now called a tanning bed and prevented cavities. So when you go do your tanning, you get a 36% decrease <laughs> in cavities. Um, and so uh, Philippe is a naturalist. And um, you know I, I, he's, I've been to dinners at his home, and he cooks from raw ingredients. Um, and he likes to wander in the wilderness with his family. And so I said, well, I don't think you are into supplements. So like, what do you, what do you tell your patients based on this discovery that you had? Um, and so he says, eat fish, run around naked. <laughs> um, but seriously, there are you know, nutritive sources of food, uh, um, I mean, sorry, of vitamin D uh, in food, such as supplemented milk or just any fish oil is really high in vitamin D. Um, and if you just you know, run around naked in the sun in Florida, uh, you know, you're gonna be making lots of vitamin D. And um, two things. One, most kids these days get plenty of vitamin D through supplemented dairy products. Two, lots of kids these days do not have enough vitamin D because they're not getting those products. They're not getting healthy foods that naturally have sources of vitamin D. And so the pediatricians are starting to have people, supp uh, people supplement their kids with vitamin D drop, uh, droplets uh, every day, and so we're going to see an effect on cavities from that. Uh, women of a certain age are also being told to supplement vitamin D for bone health. We're going to see less cavities because of that. Maybe we should be talking about that in dental practices. Um, now, we talked about fluoride earlier, we, we talked about trying to kill bugs earlier, and we talked about trying to keep uh, the antimicrobials that kill the bugs around in the teeth. Now, fluoride is really magical because it does help kill bacteria. It does help the bacteria grow more slowly, and it incorporates into the teeth. So if it is released by just so much acid that it's going to dissolve and come out, that fluoride reactivates and helps to control the bacteria a little bit. <clears throat> Do we have anything else that does that? There's this thing called silver. Silver kills bacteria. Silver makes bacteria grow more slowly. Silver incorporates into porosities in the teeth. And if it's released, it does those things all over again. So um, there's a medicine called silver fluoride that we're going to be talking about more. And it turns out there are a lot of studies of using silver fluoride, silver diamine fluoride, on teeth that do not yet have cavities and watching whether they start having cavities. And overall, across all of the studies, whether it's 850 five to eight year olds, 300 two to three year olds, 500 nine year olds, et cetera, Big studies, randomized clinical trials, most of these are randomized, some of them are controlled trials in some of these uh, smaller studies. There seems to be a 61% prevention of cavities. One of these studies compared once per year to twice per year and didn't see a difference. So it's very early right now in terms of having, uh, the, in terms of asking the question of do we get more effect with more frequency for prevention? But so far, the studies that show that, that evaluated once per year, looking at other studies that evaluated twice per year, that one study that does once versus twice, they're equivocal. So just putting this on a high-risk surface once a year 
gets 60% less cavities. So overall, we have kind of the iodine and fluoride together four times, six times a year, or the silver and fluoride together once a year. So here it is. Here's the summary of what we did, what we went through. Um, and so overall, we had the most potent effect that we can have on cavities is this one particular time point when the bacteria are entering the baby's mouth as the teeth are coming into the mouth, and we're having this new environment set up. The flora, the, the dental plaque, is starting to seed and mature. I think about it a lot like a garden. If you have just soil, uh, what is going to go into that soil and start growing? If you just let the field uh, grow, you're going to see whatever is next door grow in this field. Um, if you go in and weed that, uh, that soil, maybe you can promote the, the healthy things to grow. If you actually plant some of the things, maybe then we could really get somewhere. Now, we don't really have pro probiotics for dentistry yet. People are working on it. There's one lactobacillus lactis that's a little exciting, but no proof yet, I'd say. Um, but what we can do is we can kill the bad ones and the fast-growing ones, and we can control in mom the way her bacteria are passed down, and presumably that's going to work in dads and grandparents and other caretakers as well who have cavities. And so if you have a healthy caretaker, no cavities, lots of healthy bugs, put it on the baby. Fluoride, uh, fluoride and iodine, that's 60%. Silver and fluoride, 60%. Vitamin D, about 50%. So in areas where people aren't getting enough vitamin D from their food or sun exposure, this could be a really big deal. Uh, xylitol in infants and toddlers, you get this whole block here that's all about 40%. Daily professional flossing, fluoride varnish, high strength fluoride toothpaste, that's all about 40%. Um, arginine and fluoride together is also in that group. Normal fluoride toothpaste is at 22%, and we have Profis, CPP, ACP, chlorhexidine, and daily cell flossing at the bottom with no effect. Oh, right, we got some questions about if no fluoride, then what? If the, if the family says no fluoride, what are we going to do? So first, what do they think about tooth-focused fluoride that has minimal absorption into the body? Silver fluoride is the best that we have for that, where you can get a potent fluoride on a tooth and really minimal uptake into the body. Total, uh, the total dosage is as, as small as it gets. Then sugars, the diet. What causes cavities? Sugar, processed carbohydrates, and what about getting healthy vitamin Ds and Bs? I didn't show the vitamin B stuff, but there's really good evidence on vitamin B6 uh, and healthy fats. Iodine can be used on its own. Two of those studies didn't use fluoride varnish at all. They just used iodine uh, six times a year. Arginine toothpaste, there is an arginine uh, that's out there uh, that, that doesn't have fluoride, and that should have an effect about that 17%. And xylitol. So this is, I think, the the parts list for the non-fluoride folks. Um, right, sealants. Sealants work. The number there is about 71%. That doesn't treat the whole mouth. What it does do is prevent cavities on the surface that you, that you put it on. Except, what if that sealant material were active and exchanged minerals with the saliva that help to strengthen the tooth and prevent cavities. Anybody know of a material like that? Glass ionomer. Um, so there's this beautiful study in 2,500 kids where they looked at three different materials that had different amounts of glass ionomer in them, put it, the sealant on the six-year molar, and looked radiographically as to whether new cavities formed on the distal of the second baby molar right next to it. And what they found is that if they used resin, this is how many they got. That's like their control group, about yeah, 0.94 new cavities per patient. If they used a fluoride-releasing resin, what's the material that goes into the resin to help it release fluoride? Glass ionomer. Little particles of glass ionomer in there, they significantly decrease the number of new cavities. And if they just use glass ionomer as the sealant material, they get a third less new cavities on untreated surfaces. That's powerful. So. Um, the sealant doesn't just have to treat the affected surface. It can also treat nearby surfaces if you use an active material that releases minerals into the saliva uh, to nearby areas. So now we're going to dive deep into silver diamine fluoride. And what you'll hear me say is silver fluoride, and I'll explain why, uh, besides the fact that diamine is a mouthful, I'll explain why over time. 
So really, the, the silver and the fluoride uh, are the active ingredients, and the water and the ammonia are what keep, th keep it in solution to get it onto the teeth, keeps it stable on the shelf. Um, and what silver fluoride does, as we will go through in detail, is it arrests dental caries, which means that it stops the cavity, it treats the cavity, this term that none of us were ever taught in our training. It, uh, and yet it is a medically accepted term worldwide. It's in the ICD-10, 9, 8, 7. Um, it arrests, it stops cavities. It prevents cavities, and I call it directly and indirectly. And so that's where some of the data that I showed earlier um, show that if you put it on a surface, you prevent cavities on that surface. I would call that direct prevention. But also, there's two studies where they just treated the cavities with silver fluoride, and in nearby areas, they got less new cavities. So I call that indirect prevention. Um, it decreases dentin hypersensitivity. So if you have exposed dentin uh, that is hypersensitive to cold or air, um, it does a remarkable job of clogging up the tubules with silver solids that prevent movement of liquid in the tubules, prevents sensitivity. That's what it's cleared for by the FDA, just like fluoride varnish, but it actually really works very well um, and doesn't stain uh, if, there's no, if there's no demineralization, if there's no caries there. It also turns demineralized or hypomineralized areas of teeth black. So those are the four things that it does really well. Um, there was this landmark paper a little over a year ago by the American Dental Association. There was actually two papers. It was such a big deal they had to publish in the Journal of Dental Research for us academic folks, the Journal of, the Acad of American Dental Association for the clinical folks. And the two big quotes on here are, clinicians, not just dentists, clinicians are encouraged to prioritize use of non-restorative treatments based on effectiveness, safety, and feasibility. They are putting a line in the sand, putting their flag down and saying, fillings and crowns are not the only treatment for cavities anymore. There are medicines that we can use to treat cavities without restoring the teeth. The other one is that silver, silver diamine fluoride solution applied twice per year is effective for arresting advanced cavitated carious lesions on any coronal surface with moderate to high certainty. Uh, silver fluoride works on big cavities. We're sure of that. Now, this is really about baby teeth. It also includes permanent teeth with uh, less high certainty. So there's just less patients and less studies of permanent teeth, uh, of cavities and crowns of permanent teeth. The data are as strong. There's not as much data. So the, the effectiveness seems to be no different, really, between baby teeth and permanent teeth. It's just really about how many studies they have and therefore how confidently they can say this. We'll go through what the real data are. I wanted to use this. I've, I've shown a lot of folks this, this story of my friend Jaden um, and how he had all these cavities and we saved him from life-threatening, what for him would have been life-threatening general anesthesia uh, by putting silver fluoride on four times. Um, and then putting glass ionomer into the holes and putting these crowns with, filled with glass ionomer right over his uh, baby teeth that had um, continued cavity activity. Uh, but I, I made this chart uh, for, the, for the smart textbook that recently came out. And um, it goes through by his age, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, um, about the interventions for his cavities and the number of active cavities that are going on. So the vertical axis is the number of active cavities. So here he just had one, he got some resin, you know, a, a plastic filling. Uh, then he got more cavities, so he got more plastic fillings. Then he had a lot more cavities, then he got more plastic fillings, and that actually brought things down for a little while, uh, less than a year, about six months. And then he had lots more active cavities. And he got some stainless steel crowns. He got some more plastic, and he got an extraction, what some people like to call cold steel. Uh, extractions are forever. Um, that's our 100% effective treatment for cavities. Um, stainless steel crowns are almost that uh, good as well. They're, they're pretty darn good. They, um, anyway, so you can see plastic, 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 plastic. And this is where I met him. Uh, so he had, what is this, 15 uh, teeth with active lesions. Uh, multiple lesions on some of those teeth. 
And then we started with silver fluoride, silver fluoride, silver fluoride, silver fluoride. And at this point here, he got glass ionomer. And then silver fluoride and some more glass ionomer. So just to give you a scale of kind of the activity and the response to therapy uh, for a patient who's having lots of sugar uh, all the time just to keep him growing. So, wording. This is a lot of stuff. This is just a suggestion, partially in response to how we talked about it yesterday. We now have a medicine that treats tooth decay. It stops about 80% of cavities, takes only a minute, it leaves a bitter taste for a few minutes, and it turns the cavity black. Would you like to learn more? So I get that question a lot. How do I, how do I propose this to patients? I don't see a cavity and start showing them my information sheet on silver fluoride and the pictures. I have that, but check in with the patient. What's the, uh, the, the e EOE? It's uh, explore. What, what, tell me what the acronym is. Explore, offer, explore. So we started by exploring. There's some cavities. There's some problems. Offer, explore. Um, and then there's other verbiage down here. Uh, so I get, well, what, what is it? It sounds interesting. Um, so I, then I might say this much stuff. I might have the pictures with me uh, before or after the stain. In a back tooth, maybe on the other side for the front tooth, if it's a front tooth. So we dry the tooth and brush tiny amounts of it onto the cavities. Besides the flavor and turning cavities black, there are no other known side effects. The taste goes away in a few minutes, and healthy enamel stays white, but the cavity will stay black unless we cover it with a filling. Like other medicines, its effectiveness relies on redosing by periodic reapplication. Silver fluoride is also the most potent preventive against new cavities that there is. Here are some pictures. Please take a minute and let me know what you think. So now we're going to look at mechanisms of silver fluoride. How does this work? And, and the reason that we do this is that it helps to inform how we use it to understand its, its abilities and its limitations. And then we will work on how to get it to work. What's the clinical studies? How do we put this into a protocol? So this is my favorite slide about silver fluoride. They took a slice of dentin. They dropped it into strep mutan soup. So sugar, strep mutans, chicken broth. Um, and they grew strep mutans into the dentinal tubules of the tooth for a week. Then they took it out, rinsed it a little bit, dried it a little bit, put silver fluoride on, counted to 60, rinsed it a little bit, threw it back in the strep mutan soup for another week. Green is alive, red is dead. So this is after a week, you have bacteria crawling through the dentinal tubules en masse. One application of silver fluoride and you kill bacteria, not just at the surface, you kill them going down over a millimeter uh, into the dentinal tubules just from application on the top for a minute. Eventually, if you're 100% strep mutans, 100% sugar all the time, the bacteria will come back. Less so. So the yellow, red and green lights make yellow, um, the yellow is dead bacteria and living bacteria. So eventually, the strep mutans will overwhelm the silver and get the silver to dissipate into the saliva solution um, and start to grow back in. But they grow back in from the top. So this tells us that reapplying every now and then makes sense. If there's more caries activity, I mean, in a week of 24 hours a day, sugar and strep mutans, you know, started to get the bacteria growing back in again. If you have a patient with 24 hours a day, sugar and strep mutans, they might need silver fluoride more often than a patient who just has sugar once or twice a day and it stays on their teeth for 10, 15 minutes. So the more caries activity, the more reapplications uh, frequency makes sense. And the less, the less. So I have taken a very deep dive using clinical samples to try to follow how the bacteria change over time after silver fluoride. And if you look at it with a really blunt tool of just saying, what's the strep mutans counts? Yes, they plummet. You have less pla you treat a cavity with silver fluoride, the area around it will have much less plaque. You don't need a strep mutans count to look at that, it's just less plaque, less bugs, and definitely less strep mutans. But how does the population of the plaque change? 
We know that po the population of the plaque is important because of the xylitol work. You give mom xylitol, the change of the dynamic of the bacteria in the kids. You give people arginine, it changes what their bacteria does and changes their, their relative levels of strep mutans. Does strep mutans disappear with silver fluoride? Do the other cavity-causing bacteria disappear with silver fluoride? Do some of the other bacteria that are similar to strep mutans but are healthy for us, do they disappear? Are we having unintended side effects on the bacteria that would make us worried? Long story short, we use the most sophisticated technology there is to monitor all of the microbes, the viruses, the fungus, the, the yeast, the bacteria, and there were no significant decreases in a blinded clinical trial, placebo, multiple teeth samples before and after versus treated with silver fluoride samples before and after multiple teeth, 20 kids in each group, no significant loss of any bacteria in relation to each other, less bacteria overall. But if you put this on like an equalizer on your stereo, it would just be like you turned down the volume. So overall, we didn't really change the population very much. If you take penicillin for an infection, your gut, the reason you feel weird for a week, is that your gut bacteria completely shift. Somehow, silver fluoride seems to be this equal opportunity killer. And it turns out that, um, I, mean, I said it wrong earlier, the one bacteria that if we have enough data, enough patients, the one bacteria that we see significantly increased uh, after a few weeks following silver fluoride treatment, following successful silver fluoride treatment, um, is Lactobacillus ruteri. This happens to be the one promising probiotic against cavities. As of now, there's a study in older adults and two studies in young kids that this is the one bacteria of all the ones that have tried that actually seems to maybe prevent cavities. So more work needs to be done. But wouldn't it be sweet if just we could, instead of introducing some laboratory bug to help prevent cavities, that we're actually already doing that just by treating with this medicine. So overall, the story is, um, is that in terms of antimicrobial <coughs> resistance genes and in terms of bacteria, we're really not changing much of anything. We're just low quieting the bacteria down equally across all of them. So this is really reassuring to safety. Makes us wonder how this is really working, but it's really reassuring to safety. So there's no dangerous, dangerous effects on the microbiome. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, figures ever. This is from 1908. Uh, back in the day when you would look in a microscope and draw by hand uh, what things looked like. And this is, so this is G.B. Black drawing bacteria in dentinal tubules, kind of like what we saw earlier. Um, and so this is just to say that the way that cavities grow, of course, the bacteria invade from the outside, but then they, they create these little micro-cavitations. And so there's these little pockets of where bacteria are growing and starting to eat away the dentin, create little niches for themselves. And what we're seeing is that not only does silver fluoride go penetrate into there and kill the bacteria, but we're seeing that it leaves silver solids in those microcavitations. So we've done a bunch of work um, taking teeth that were treated with silver fluoride clinically, and then either they exfoliated or they were extracted for orthodontic purposes, uh, and putting them in a, in a CAT scan, but a microscopic CAT scan. And what we find is that there's, this is the best picture, that there's these silver, solid silver wires that form in the dentinal tubules. And some of the, the, the images like this show these little microcavitations being filled up with silver. So the voids that weaken the tooth and create niches for the bacteria to grow and cause problems are not only the kill the bacteria, but actually fills those little voids with solid silver that structurally reinforces uh, the tooth. Um, and so we think that this is the reason why the lesion gets harder. Um, and, and really is a good foundation for a restoration if that seems to be indicated. Uh, and so the way that this translates for me is really what I just said. I put silver fluoride down, the cavity's arrested uh, for whatever reason, which we will get into. If I really feel like I want to put a restoration there, I don't want to take that away. I want to leave that there. That's the best foundation, the best base for my restoration that I could possibly have. It's twice as hard on average as freshly cut dentin. Um, and so overall, it seems like the, the way that this stuff wor seems to work is it's is silver and fluoride soak into, the silver soaks into the porosities of the tooth. The fluoride soaks in and creates fluoroapatite. And as bacterial activity eventually overwhelms that and starts releasing the silver, it helps kill the bacteria. 
that are trying to invade. So the, dead, the silver that is embedded in the dead bacteria that's sitting around reactivates to kill the living bacteria. So it's kind of like the dead are coming back to kill the living. We call this the zombie effect. It's cute. Um, and this is about the question of how fast. So we've tried to use those same uh, micro CAT scan uh, technology to ask the question of how quickly uh, does silver fluoride go through a caries lesion. So this is a permanent tooth. In the middle, here's the pulp chamber. Uh, for various reasons of the technology, I had to cut off the back of the tooth. Uh, but this is a tooth that's been kept moist. It has liquid inside the pulp chamber, so there's, it's not like a dry tooth. And it's, it's hard to see with this lighting, but the outside of the lesion is out here. So this is like three millimeters, uh, two and a half millimeters from the outside of the lesion to the base of the lesion. And um, the limit of the technology, this is before, this is 10 minutes after application, the silver fluoride has already gone to the base of the lesion, but not as much of it as we would like. And so after 10 minutes, there is some down millimeters into a lesion. But after an hour, you get this wave front, where you get this density, that's the silver, that gets down to the bottom of the lesion. So it will get down to the bottom of any lesion, I assure anyone. Prove me wrong. Uh, and if you have a really deep, thick lesion that's been growing slowly for a time, um, the bulk of the silver fluoride takes a while to get down to the bottom. Some will get down quickly, but it will keep moving towards the bottom of the lesion over about an hour. And then those silver solids actually take about a week to really form. So that's, that's more slow. Uh, three days to, to seven days is really where we see the solid silver wires forming. So it's, it's a lot, it quickly dives down, but you need some time before it kind of, the bulk of it gets down even further, and then that reaction actually takes a lot longer than we expected. This slide is, don't forget about the fluoride. Uh, so there's a beautiful story you can find uh, on the MMC library, the Medical Management of Caries library, uh, about a little girl named Claire and her mom, Christina, and this is Claire's tooth that we took to the micro CAT scan, and what I'll tell you is that um, Steve Duffin and John Fricella saved this little kiddo from going to general anesthesia by painting some silver fluoride on her teeth. And before she started kindergarten, uh, covering up the black silver stain with some glass ionomer material, an opaque glass ionomer material. And the black right there is silver. When I scan this tooth and look for variations in density, I see this thin layer on the top that's really dense, but white. What that is, is fluoroapatite. And so what's really protecting the rest of her tooth, there's very, there's very little silver, if any, in the rest of her tooth. What is there is lots of fluoride. So don't forget that this is actually the highest concentration silver, uh, fluoride product that we have. So you're getting a silver effect on any of the porous area. We have these micro cavitations, or any cavitated area. But you're also getting the effect of the fluoride. Um, so don't forget about the fluoride. Okay, how to get it to work. Now, by now pretty much everybody has heard the way that we use silver fluoride is we dry, we apply, and we say bye. But we can do a little bit better. And so what I would say is that protecting the reaction for about a minute is really key. Um, and so there's lots of ways to do that. One way is to cover with Vaseline or a varnish immediately after treatment. So what I do is I'll dry as well as I can with air if possible, otherwise just with cotton. Um, I'll put the silver fluoride on and what I want to see is the lesion go from being dry to the lesion being moist. If there's any pooled silver fluoride, and now I, I kind of just, I know I look a couple times, maybe I'll add it two or three times for an active lesion. Uh, I'll count to five. <laughs> Remove the excess with cotton, and then put the varnish over the top. For anti-fluoride families, we'll talk about that. I just use Vaseline. You just want to protect that reaction so that enough can soak in for about a minute. If you have cooperation from your patient, you could just sit there for a minute, or have the cotton sit there. The patient can do it themselves. Um, for me, I have special needs patients. I have two-year-olds. I have freaked out nine-year-olds. I have whatever. I want to go fast. So I just count to five, watch it kind of soak in, make sure there's not pooled excess, and then cover. So this is the Dr. Jeanette McLean TLC protocol. Uh, Vaseline beard, <laughs> uh, this stuff stains. <laughs> so 
Uh, lips in particular seem to, it's hard to get the stain off of the lips. So you start with the lips and oh, it's getting everywhere. Oh, it's getting, oh, it's everywhere. Um, so I just kind of go more of like a goatee. Um, and then I, I go back and forth on this. Um, if a patient is really taste sensitive, it can help to have a nice tasting toothpaste on their tongue and in particular underneath their nose if they're really sensitive to smells because um, this silver fluoride does have an ammonia smell. Isolation, at least cotton. I use cotton rolls, that's what I do. Um, dry, as well as reasonable. If the patient really isn't gonna tolerate air, maybe the tooth is really sensitive, maybe they're really phobic, cotton will work. Maybe you're in the field. The clinical trials did not have compressed air. They had cotton. Uh, apply to moisten. Count to five, remove the excess, protect the reaction, either wait a minute or cover it, like we just said, and then water. In the water, none of the studies have, have told the kids to not drink for half an hour or anything like that, that we do with fluoride varnish. Um, what I do is if the kid's really having a hard time with the flavor, is I will pour water on the tongue. I don't want them to you know, rinse out the silver fluoride, but I have no problem putting water on their tongue. And the other thing I'll do is I'll take a two by two gauze and I'll wipe the tongue off. That's also really helpful. I've done both of those things to myself and it really makes a huge difference. And there's a very subtle taste left over after that. But you deal with kind of the tongue, not the whole mouth. I don't want a kid swishing it away because from the kinetics works, what we saw is that yes, it soaks in pretty quickly, but it does take a while to get down to the bottom of the tooth. So I don't want a whole bunch of water rinsing all of that out right away. Okay, so the suggested frequency protocol. I'm gonna tell you, then I'm gonna show you why, and then I'm gonna tell you again. Then we're gonna pause. Okay, we have really good evidence. Q6 months, I'm sorry about my abbreviations. Uh, this is like a prescription, uh, that's the Latin abbreviations that we use for prescription. Every six months. Twice a year, this is my timeline. See the cavity, treat it, treat it again in six months, treat it again in 12 months, treat it. Mild caries. Uh, that means that there's not like a big fuzzy lesion on a tooth. That means that um, there's white spots or yellow spots, but there's not big scary stuff going on. This works extraordinarily well. Moderate caries. Let's say they would fall into high caries risk, maybe moderate caries risk. They have a couple cavities. I guess that would be higher caries, but not, not extreme caries risk. Um, you look at their teeth. It's not the worst thing you've ever seen. I'm going to add one loading dose after two to six weeks. You know, let's say one to six weeks. Um, and still follow the every six month protocol. I want to see the patient every six months if they have the cavities. When I see them, I'm going to put silver fluoride on their teeth. And if they have raging cavities, we're going to add maybe two extra loading doses, maybe three extra loading doses. So if I see a patient, they have lots of cavities, it looks scary, I'm worried about their cavities going into their pulp and starting to cause pain and infection. I put it on when I see the cavities, then I have them back in two weeks, maybe four weeks after that, maybe two months after that, and then we're gonna revert to the every six months. So the deal is, just like you would handle a facial cellulitis, so a raging infection in the face, it's all about getting a high enough level of antibiotic at the beginning to control the infection and then maintaining with doses after that. So what do you do if a patient has just a you know, high temperature, raging uh, cellulitis, you're worried about the infection, let's say an adult, going into a dangerous area, you get them on IV antibiotics. That brings the amount of antibiotic up in the bloodstream to handle the infection. And then you give them a pill every eight hours or every 12 hours, depending on what the pill is. And long term, the thing that matters probably the most is that periodic pill until the, everything's under control. Now dentistry is much slower. This is thankfully a slower process. So what we do is, if you see cavities, we medicate just like you would medicate with penicillin, you know, every eight hours, we medicate every six months. And if there's raging infection in the teeth, you add extra doses depending on how much more activity is going on. Okay, we're gonna march through these data. Uh, these are the clinical trials on treating cavities in kids. There are similar studies in, in older adults. 
uh, and I'm, we're going to talk through all of it. So a few hundred patients in each study. These are on average six-year-olds. These are on average three to four-year-olds, three to four-year-olds, three to five-year-olds, three to four-year-olds, three to nine-year-olds, and five to six-year-olds, each a different study um, using silver diamine fluoride. Uh, and the bars, the higher the bar is, the more, uh, the higher the fraction of cavities that are stopped. So if the bar went all the way to the top, that'd mean 100%. If there was no bar at all, that'd mean no effect. Everywhere is kind of in between, as you'll see. And the timeline, this is after one year, this is after two years, these are after three years. So these are long-term studies. Um, and so we're going to zero in on what each study tells us. First study that was done, um, they evaluated silver fluoride with or without caries removal. So when you put a glass ionomer on or a filling in, you want to excavate at least some of it, and then you put your filling material in. Do we need to do that for silver fluoride? That's orange versus black. No difference after two and a half years. Don't excavate. Doesn't make any sense. This is looking at the frequency of application. The red is twice per year. The black is once per year. The red goes higher than the black. This, they also looked at the percentage of silver fluoride, the, the, the concentration. 38% is red and black versus 12% is pink and gray. The more is in there, the better it works. And even the low concentration stuff works to an extent. So we get a boost in effectiveness from twice per year versus once per year. You see the absolute numbers are different. This is kind of about 78% uh, versus 91%. So that's an important boost, an extra 10% or so of extra effectiveness, really decreasing the number of cavities that are going to keep growing. This study, we got a similar size of boost, but here it went from about 65% to 75%. So the absolute numbers are still being worked out. This study is very interesting. They put it on once and never again. If you look at six months, after six months, about 45% of cavities are stopped with one application. If you don't put it on again, those cavities start up after a while. Just like we saw with the first mechanism slide of the dead bacteria, living bacteria, eventually the bacteria will overwhelm and start the cavity back up. Behaviors don't change. There's no other protective factors. The effect goes away. So these, this study in particular tells us we need to keep putting it on to maintain and build on our effectiveness. It also increases in effect over time. This study is a little bit frustrating because they used a material that was supposed to be 30%, but really it was about 9%. So lower concentration material, and really what they were asking is, if we put this stuff on three times in two weeks, and then never again, how's that going to compare to just once per year? And if you look at the numbers, what's interesting, the gray is just once per year. And after two and a half years, the once per year has more cavities stopped than doing it three times at the beginning. After six months, the three times in the beginning was better. But you need to keep putting it on over time. Have I said that yet? You need to keep putting it on over time. So we can combine those things. We can put this on multiple times towards the beginning of therapy and then have our maintenance doses. It's also been compared to glass ionomer. And overall, if you scoop and fill with glass ionomer, whether you call that ITR, ART, or scoop and fill glass ionomers, one, doing that once per year, and if it falls out, putting it on again once per year, has about the same level of effectiveness. And there's one new study that I haven't put in that just came out this month. Um, same thing, it's about the same. Silver fluoride was a little bit better, but not statistically significantly different. Silver fluoride, just dry and apply, versus like scooping out and putting glass ionomer in. Why not combine those things? Scoop a little out, put silver fluoride on, glass ionomer. Or just put silver fluoride on, then come back later and scoop what you need to, if any, and then put glass ionomer. That study has started. It's underway. We're going to see results in about a year. Um, this is one other new thing that just came out last year. They took 200 kids in each, uh, sorry, 500 kids. <laughs> 500 kids, uh, in each group. They had five cavities on average at the start, and they treated them either with uh, silver nitrate and fluoride varnish, or silver diamine fluoride and an empty varnish. Uh, and the results are equivocal. The, the outcomes are about the same. 
So this tells me um, that in countries where fluoride varnish is really inexpensive, uh, maybe financially it would make sense for folks to do that. Uh, here, I don't, I don't think that makes a lot of sense. Um, but either way, it's about the silver and the fluoride. And so I think this better than anything tells us that the active ingredients that we really need are silver and fluoride. And it works. Okay, so that was sort of the, the science and argument behind, you know, the maintenance of dose is the most important. Once per year works, twice per year works better. Getting that loading dose built up, especially if people have more active cavities, helps to control the disease from the start. Um, just like an infection. And so this, just looking at, at these st studies in particular, the other thing to really, that all dental clinicians really need to wrap their heads around, is this new thing that we are treating a cavity and we're not seeing the effect immediately. If there's a cavity, I drill it and fill it, that moment is the best that tooth is ever gonna be because eventually that filling is gonna break down. So the way that we monitor that is we look at the filling every six months or every year, or whatever we can do. In this case, we're putting on a medicine and the maximum effectiveness, we're not reaching until like 18 to 24 months. So normally the dentist wants to treat it in six months, you're good, can we keep you good? In this case, at six months, only about 45% of the cavities are gonna look stopped. Now how do we differentiate the ones that are going to keep growing, this portion that we never get, from the ones that will stop eventually. So that is where I give you this. And this is based on an interpretation of the data and having watched this in patients for uh, really about seven years now um, intensely. And this is, this is the following. So at six months, at our six month recall, uh, there's about 10 to 30% that'll be growing, 20%. That will be bigger than it was when it started. So you see a cavity, treat it with silver fluoride, whatever your, your, your protocol is. At six months, if the lesion is obviously bigger, that lesion needs a different therapy. If the lesion is still active but has stayed the same size, it will stop with time. If it's arrested, you're good, obviously. Keep applying once a year, you're fine. Twice a year, if, thing, you, know, if you want to feel better, and it probably will work better. But that's, that's the best that I've been able to figure out from looking at my x-rays and my pictures over time is that the ones that have grown, obviously, clinically, uh, looking at it, or by x-rays, uh, they get something else. And if they haven't grown, but they still look active, those are the ones that will stop with time. Um, the other big piece of information, there's this guy, Graham Craig, who's been using silver diamine fluoride and his other silver fluoride permutations for 40 years. Uh, what he's figured out from his clinical studies, mainly observational, just treating everybody the same way and looking afterwards, uh, is this. He put this together. Um, is that if a lesion is cleansable, if a cavitated carries lesion, um, isn't trapping plaque, that is extremely likely to stop with silver fluoride therapy. If it is trapping plaque, that is the least likely to stop with silver fluoride therapy. So if you have a proximal lesion, you know, the distal between two teeth, and it's like, you know, shaped like, you know, like a C, that's the least likely to stop. If you have a surface lesion that's pretty smooth, that's extremely likely to stop. Um, and so similarly, the size of the contact point between teeth also dictates that. So between the front teeth, any of the front teeth, I, I think I'm pretty near 100% <laughs> with silver fluoride. I mean, really. Um, the contact area is very small, so it doesn't trap very much plaque. It's very easy to clean. Between the back teeth, you have a larger contact area where there's a larger region for sugars and bacteria to get trapped and overwhelm the silver. So those are the areas that are least likely to stop with silver fluoride therapy. This matches exactly the data from the modern clinical trials that have gone back and looked at what cavities grew and which didn't. Steve and I came up with this a couple years ago. Uh, how much fluoride is really in a droplet of silver fluoride? Um, so this comes around when, you're, when patients are kind of concerned about the amount of fluoride that they're, that they're exposed to. 
And it turns out if you have like a two liter of fluoridated tap water, that is how much fluoride is in a whole large drop of silver fluoride. Consolidating that to the weakest parts of the teeth instead of giving that to the entire systemic exposure is, is what we're seeing. So, you know, how would you feel if you had to drink a two liter of tap water twice a year, of, of fluoridated tap water twice a year? How would you feel about that fluoride exposure? Not every day, just twice a year. And instead of it going through your entire system, that it gets absorbed into just your caries lesions, just the weakest part of your teeth. Uh, with that explanation, I think a lot more people um, have a better understanding of, of what exposure is going on and choose to. If you look at um, a typical fluoride varnish packet, that fluoride varnish packet has six times as much fluoride as one drop of silver fluoride. So you need six drops of silver fluoride to get as much fluoride as a packet of fluoride varnish. Okay, so that's a, a sense of how much is in there. How much gets absorbed into the body? So this is where they used, they took a bunch of healthy adults and treated their caries lesions with silver fluoride and watched the amount of fluoride in their bloodstream. This is baseline before they did anything. It did not significantly change. And if you look at the pattern, it looks like it decreased. I don't tell anybody it decreases, but it definitely did not increase the amount of fluoride in the bloodstream. So with routine, careful administration of silver fluoride onto caries lesions and high-risk surfaces, we get basically, not basically, we get no measurable increase of fluoride content in the blood at all. If you brush your teeth with fluoride toothpaste, you get a little bump. This is nothing. And the bump is small with fluoride toothpaste, but nothing. Okay, if you get stains, one of my take homes is always silver fluoride stains the crap out of everything. So um, this Jeanette McLean has been the, uh, the maven of putting all of this together. There are a lot of different materials that we can use to help get the silver stain off of fabrics or surfaces or skin. Um, and so uh, hydrogen peroxide is really the big go-to for skin uh, stains to help get it off. It can, um, nappy sand, you gotta order this stuff from Australia. Uh, I got it, it works. It helps get rid of stain on fabric. Um, hydrogen peroxide, like I said, for really resistant stains on skin, you can use just anything abrasive. Profi paste, salt, whatever. Um, but uh, peroxide is, is harder. So here you have um, <laughs> stain on the hand, went to, <laughs> went to CVS and got some hydrogen peroxide, and that's what they got. There, there was still you know, a subtle but, but visible stain, and then with a salt slurry with that uh, peroxide, uh, it came off. So there's a little bit of exfoliating uh, that you do, and, and then it's gone. Um, same thing with the lips. So just, uh, if you get a stain, and I can't even really see where this is in this picture, but it, it's, a good, it's a good helpful uh, resource that hydrogen peroxide is the first step. If it's really resistant, you can use some, anything abrasive, and the simplest thing is the salt slurry. Now, this is for you guys. Uh, this was a hygienist who's, uh, I think at the time she was eight years old, um, wasn't brushing her teeth at all. The hygienist is, you know, she's, she's like you guys. She's not just any hygienist. She's brilliant, powerhouse. And so she came and showed us this stain. Uh, she used silver fluoride to try to prevent cavities. She read the literature and said, this is the best preventive I can, I can use. My kid's not brushing her teeth. She doesn't have a lot of sugar in her diet, but I don't want her to get cavities on her front teeth. So I'm going to use silver fluoride to prevent them from getting cavities. And oops, we got a little stain. So there was demineralization that had already started. Um, so it is hardest to get out of this situation. I'm not going to talk about any particular products. But there have been uh, claims of non-staining silver fluorides out there. Um, and so this is just an example of a product that obviously does not stain before and after. The lesion did not change color. We don't use the term black. There is no black, right? Yeah, obviously, the silver fluoride stains carries lesions. Uh, and there's not a lot that we can do about that, regardless of extra steps. Also. I'm not going to name names, but there is a product that is pH 13. Most silver fluoride products in the world are pH 10. Neutral is 7, so pH 10 is like, is like pH 4 in acidity, and pH 13 is like pH 1 
acidity and basicity. So this is like, you know, the opposite of like battery acid. This is like what you would use to clean out your drains. Um, it is extremely basic and therefore um, not safe to apply to the gums, mucosa, or lips. And so we have seen since this product came out um, and people are using it in a way that it wasn't intended to be used, as in cotton, dry, and apply, um, they're using it in that way and they're getting it, of course, a little bit on the gums and the mucosa and the lips and we are seeing chemical burns. So if a product is pH 13, um, the head of sales for North America for this product uh, says that you should use a rubber dam or gingival barrier. This is really intended to be underneath a filling. It is, so all of the other products in the world are pH 10 and you can dry and apply and put them on with cotton. But in this case, we really, for safety, we really need to use a rubber dam and gingival barrier. And that same brilliant woman who's the head of sales for North America for the company that holds this product says that everyone should have both available. Uh, and so in the case where you're trying to arrest cavities without a restoration, uh, she said this product should not be used. Okay. So, um, we got some questions about using silver fluoride near the pulp. There have been studies about the safety and effect on the pulp uh, of silver fluoride. When you take a tooth that doesn't have a cavity, you make a cavity that's half a millimeter to a quarter millimeter from the pulp. You put nothing on, you put calcium hydroxide on, you put uh, glass anamer on, or you put silver fluoride on. And overall, uh, those three materials, calcium hydroxide, glass anamer, and silver fluoride, all had minimal effect on the pulp after six weeks. When they took the tooth out section that looked at the pulp, they got uh, tertiary dentin formation. There was no microabscesses. Um, they're good. So these studies have been done. They, they have not, not been done. Um, so I have never seen uh, silver fluoride irritate the pulp as long as there is some dentin between where I'm putting it and the pulp. Yes, some silver gets into the pulp, but there does not seem to be um, a reaction. Now, as a clinician, I have experienced teeth where I knew this was a really deep lesion. I had a conversation with the family and they chose for me to put silver fluoride on that tooth knowing that we may be too late. And the tooth did abscess. Now, was that the silver fluoride? or Was that the lesion already being in the pulp? Um, I don't think anybody can really say that. But what else would you have done? <laughs> you know? Um, in an ideal world, maybe right in that moment, you could do a pulpotomy and crown on a tooth or a partial pulpotomy on a permanent tooth and then a restoration. Um, but in reality, most clinical situations, you're not doing the diagnostic visit and the treatment visit at the same time. And so for me, the best diagnostic that I can do for a really deep lesion where I'm not 100% certain about where the pulp is going to go between now and whatever I might do in the future is I can put silver fluoride on it. And then we might have to deal with the consequences of the tooth uh, of the pulp dying. But I don't know how else to save the pulp. So that's kind of our, uh, our go-to. So yes, we might be too late sometimes. Um, in my experience, that has been exceedingly rare. If I am able to look, feel, or see in an x-ray any band of dentin between the pulp and the lesion, even like a half millimeter, um, I will go ahead and put silver fluoride on it. And I have, maybe I'm really lucky, uh, but a lot of my friends are too. Uh, all of my friends are too of getting a lot of these lesions to stop. The pulp reacts well, um, and then we can, in that case, that kind of situation, you probably want to put a restoration on uh, quickly if it's really near the pulp. The other thing that we wanted to talk about was gingivitis. Sorry for putting all the numbers on here. I just added this slide. Um, there is a study of uh, gingival index score, multi-center, one in Cusco and one in Lima, uh, where there was a um, 25, about 25% reduction in inflammation in the gums in the treatment group and no effect whatsoever in the placebo group um, of the gums around exposed root surfaces that were also carious. Um, this is published. This is the same study that, used, um, that was used to get FDA clearance for sensitivity. So it affects sensitivity of exposed dentin. It also decreases gingival inflammation, a.k.a. gingivitis. So there is a study that we can point to. It's a multi-centered study. It's a study that the FDA has accepted for others of its outcomes. It's there. Anecdotally, a lot of us see really positive responses to the gums. Just wanted to make sure you guys had that. So take-homes on silver fluoride. 80% of lesions stop. 
uh, when used once or more per year. That's the number we're just stopping at now. There is a study that shows 90%, but the average overall seems to be about 80%. Prevents about 60% of new lesions, dry before use, safe, stains the crap out of everything, and there are things that we can do about the stain. Um, smart protocols. This is probably worth spending like all the time on, but just really quickly, same day smart, you take out whatever amount of the cavity you're gonna take out, and then whether you put conditioner or silver fluoride on first or last, whatever, that's a philosophical difference. Either way, it helps. And then you put your glass ionomer on. Some people argue one way, some people argue the other way. Uh, there's no really good science on the same day smart. What you can say is that the purpose of conditioner is to clean up the mineral, the dentin and the enamel, so that the glass ionomer can interact with it directly. Gets rid of the plaque and the pellicle, so the glass ionomer can interact with the hydroxyapatite. That's the chemical bond of glass ionomer. That's why we need conditioner. There are other ways to achieve that, like a microabrasion, um, but that's the idea. So for me, I do that step. There's no pellicle or plaque in silver fluoride. Uh, silver fluoride does not get in the way of the interaction between glass ionomer and hydroxyapatite. So to me, it makes sense to condition first and then um, rinse and dry and then put the silver fluoride in to moisten the lesion, take the excess out either with a uh, suction or a cotton, and then put the glass ionomer in with the tooth still moist. So then I'm maximizing the amount of silver and fluoride in the lesion that's gonna stay there and help protect the tooth, make it stronger and all that. That's what makes sense to me. Two day smart, this is what I did for Jaden, which I didn't explain in detail here, but I have many times previously, is I put silver fluoride on once, twice, however many times is convenient and, and reasonable, um, and then at a different visit, I don't excavate at all. I want to do something to disrupt, to, to get rid of the plaque and pellicle that's on the periphery of a lesion. So this is like a cavitated class one lesion and occlusal, maybe it goes to the lingual or the buccal, but I can access the enamel all the way around the lesion. So I like to use a profi brush to get rid of the plaque, conditioner to get rid of the pellicle so that my glass animer can interact directly with the enamel. And then I push on the glass animer. I can do this in two-year-olds, I can do this in 14-year-olds, and everybody in between and beyond. Um, so silver fluoride once, no silver fluoride on this day, um, and you get rid of the plaque and the pellicle around the lesion. The lesion is at least mainly hard uh, by then conditioner to get rid of the plaque and pellicle, and then glass ionomer. And what I want to do is I want to preserve the moisture in the glass ionomer for three minutes. I want to put it in quickly, stop touching it after one minute after the mix, and then the next two minutes we have to protect the moisture, not getting too dry, not getting too moist. I do that by just putting some Vaseline right over the top. Have the patient bite down, they just adjusted their bite, get rid of the excess, done. This is what this looks like. So I don't have a pre-silver fluoride, but this is silver fluoride, kid had just turned three years old, glass ionomer, this is like six months after treatment. So yes, you see a tiny little bit of stain, but now I have treated the lesion chemically, sealed it up, you know, you can hardly see anything there. Um, so this picture, also I did a sealant on this tooth, right, that was easy. Also I did a sealant on this tooth, that was easy. I just moved the brush forward and back, put the conditioner on all three teeth, swiped glass ionomer with my finger, and six months later we still had glass ionomer in all of those places, pretty simple. So these were cavitated lesions in a three-year-old uh, who was not cooperative for treatment. I could get him cooperative enough to let me look in his mouth. And so I got silver fluoride really well on these back uh, teeth and then had him back three weeks later and used a brush, conditioner, and a really opaque glass animer that covered the stain beautifully but is also you know, hyper white. And then a more typical semi-translucent glass animer um, that doesn't cover the stain as well uh, but is kind of more tooth colored. So you can see, compare and contrast what those colors are. So here there's a study about how bond strength is affected. And like our forest plots that we were looking at earlier, this is a meta-analysis that combines the studies from the data from 11 different studies. And it's so, it shows that glass ionomer bonding, there's no effect. We're totally fine. All the studies show no effect. Resin impairs the bonding to adhesive systems to dentin specifically, enamel no problem, but silver fluoride impairs the bond to resin 
and that this can be completely eliminated by just rinsing afterwards. So our protocol, if you want to place silver fluoride and plastic the same day, is you rinse after a minute, and then you're good. So that's the synthesis of lots of studies, and it just shows that, yes, there were, there were one study where there was an effect on bond strength. They didn't rinse afterwards. So all of the other studies that did with or without the rinse step showed, yes, if you don't rinse, it affects the bond a little bit. If you do rinse, that goes away. Um, you know, we've, we've marched through a lot of material today. Uh, we talked about a lot of preventive materials and how they can really work. We helped choose which ones actually work and which ones are a waste of time. Antimicrobials and remineralizing agents together work really well. Um, we talked about silver fluoride, what it is, how it works, and how to get it to work. We talked about uh, strategies for controlling disease by frequency. Lots of doses at the beginning if the disease is more active, and then the most important thing is maintenance doses over time until you get the disease under control, and then maybe we can slow down and just monitor. Uh, we talked about safety and cleanup. There are materials to handle the stain. There are more coming, and smart combinations where bond strength is really not affected, and so really what you want to do is control um, the color change if that's important to you, and the simplest way to control the color change is by not placing silver fluoride and the restoration the same day. You can excavate the margins if there's black at the margins, if that's really important to you, and then put your restoration on, voila. Um, and there are more opaque materials to help handle the stain, and there are translucent materials that you can put over that to make it picture-perfect dentistry. So with that, thank you so much for your time. That's all. Thank you.